Hi, it's John Kelly. In this module, we are going to discuss goodwill and intangibles, a little bit about how to account for them, and a little bit about how to audit them. And we're going to talk about IAS 36, 38, and your first three. Now I'm going to take a bit of a simplified view of the accounting. I'm taking something of an auditor's perspective. Um, under IFRS, accounting for goodwill and intangibles can get very detailed and there's a lot of defined terms, but that detail is the client's job. From an auditor's perspective, in the end it's always about cash flow. Does the asset recognize produce cash flow sufficient to justify the value of the asset? The other thing is that once you have decided what to allocate the amount to, it's locked in. So a couple of years later, if you decided to allocate something to a customer relationship asset and that's gone away and needs to be written off, you can't then later decide to allocate it to some other asset. So once you've done it, it's decided and it's locked in. The other thing, I guess, as an auditor, I'm not a big fan of reperformance as an audit procedure. So assigning junior staff to redo the math and finding that two and two is still four is a poor way of auditing goodwill and determining whether an impairment is necessary. Much better is to use professional skepticism during planning, standing back, looking at the big picture, and thinking about whether or not it makes sense that the goodwill is still there or not. Once you've done that, if you then want to assign staff to reperform the math, I guess that's okay. Um, but it's a question of trying to see the forest for the trees. And if all you're doing is redoing the math, you are going to miss the forest for all the lovely trees you look at. So I'm not a fan of reperformance. Now, the other thing to remember is goodwill and impairment of goodwill or impairment of intangibles is one of many estimates in the financial statements, and it depends on lots and lots of management assumptions. So depending on how close the estimate of the future economic benefit is to the asset that we're trying to decide whether or not is impaired, we're going to have some different decisions to make. If there's a big gap, if there's lots and lots of future economic benefit and it's pretty clear that there's no need for impairment, I guess we don't need to worry. But when it starts to get close and there's some sensitivity to the assumptions, probably a good idea for the auditor to ask management to disclose that measurement uncertainty and to disclose the assumptions used and to disclose the fact that if you change an assumption from 3% to 4%, it suddenly causes the asset to be impaired. And that's in management's best interest, and it's also in the auditor's best interest. Now, a little history of goodwill, and we've got to make sure that we're not treating goodwill in kind of a historical way. Before around 2008, we wrote goodwill off over 40 years, which was a long, long time. 40 years is longer than most of us will have a career in accountancy. If you as a young accountant set up some goodwill at a client on your 25th birthday, it wouldn't be fully amortized until you were 65 and retired. So 40 years is a long, long time. But at least we were slowly amortizing it away, and it was slowly going away at least. The other thing, we did things kind of arbitrarily. We bought a subsidiary. We looked whether or not property, plant, and equipment were worth more than they were on the books and adjusted for that, and then all the rest was called goodwill. We didn't think about whether or not there were any other assets that we had bought that had a fair value different from book value other than property, plant, and equipment. So there was then an international effort to find a better way to allocate, and I will observe that allocations are arbitrary, uh, always arbitrary, so allocating one way and allocating another way is not necessarily better, but never mind. The other thing, there was an intention of shortening the amortization period to 20 years or something like that. And in a sudden and dizzying U-turn, the standard setters decided not to amortize goodwill at all. And if you want to research why that happened, you can. So after that, goodwill is no longer amortized, but there's three important things we have to think about as we recognize goodwill. The first thing is you have to consider whether you paid too much. 
did the client getting caught up in a bidding frenzy to acquire this subsidiary. They knew how much they were prepared to pay and why, but in the end they paid more than they should have, more than they intended to, to acquire the subsidiary. And if that's the case, that additional amount that we just paid too much and got no value for it, that needs to be written off immediately. That's a little difficult to acknowledge. You just are so happy you got this subsidiary and you won, but you also have to recognize that you paid too much and write something off. So that's the first thing you have to think about. Second thing you have to think about is you have to allocate the purchase price to a whole long list of identifiable, intangible things. And there are lots, long, long list on the next slide. Some people would argue that if you bought a subsidiary, you should be able to allocate all of the purchase price discrepancy to intangible assets because you should know, you should be able to identify why you paid the price you paid. And the third thing you have to consider is we now are going to have to do an annual impairment test of goodwill and of the intangible assets and we will have to know the future economic benefit that we expect from each of these, the cash flow. And we have to know that on acquisition so we can justify what we set up on acquisition. And that of course also means that our impairment test is pretty simple because now we just redo the math. We know why we paid, we know the future benefit we expected to get. And so we should be able to, on an annual basis, check that. And there's an awfully long list of intangible assets, which is why I say that if you have purchased a subsidiary, you should know why you did it and allocate it to all of these things. And the only way I guess you end up with goodwill, goodwill is unidentifiable and you say, well, we really have no idea why this subsidiary makes so much money but it just makes a lot, a lot of money and we can't explain it. And that's goodwill. And that's a little dangerous. So first we allocate to intangibles. Intangibles have to be identifiable as opposed to goodwill, which is not. And it's recognizable if there is a future economic benefit and the cost can be measured. And the recognition criteria are a bit different in the business combination, but the future economic benefit thing remains. And if our intangible asset has a finite life, we are to amortize it on a systematic basis over the expected useful life. Residual amount is normally zero, though I guess in exceptional, except, exceptional circumstances that might not be the case. And the method and the useful life for an intangible asset have to be reviewed annually. And the client does it and we check. And that gets back to what I said about reperformance and professional skepticism and the standing back and looking at the big picture. So there are many ways we can check it, but the best way to do it is to evaluate it critically using professional skepticism at the planning stage to see whether or not the goodwill still makes sense. And then if it still makes sense, running through the math, quick and easy way to check. And goodwill is the residual, and here's the definition. Uh, definition of an intangible asset says it has to be identifiable, and that's what distinguishes it from goodwill. So goodwill is a combination of assets that are not individually identified and separately recognized, and there's sort of a synergy between these unidentified assets that produce future cash flow and therefore justify an asset called goodwill on the balance sheet. So the client has to know how to do this and it's a bit complicated. You allocate to cash generating units and the definition of that's a little hard to figure out. And you have to estimate the future economic benefit on acquisition. And there's a fine line between we paid too much and I've got a whole bunch of assets that I can't identify and I don't know what they are, but they provide an expected future benefit. So that's a very fine line as we identify the difference between goodwill and we just paid too much. Now then there's the question of impairment testing under IFRS and under for both intangible assets and goodwill, it has to be done annually. There are other accounting frameworks and by and large, they come down to you'd really better be thinking about testing goodwill and intangibles annually. It's kind of embarrassing if you decide not to test it and find out a year later that it was impaired. 
so under IFR's annual test for both. The test for intangibles is the recoverable amount, and the recoverable amount is defined as the selling price, what you could sell it for, and often you don't know that, or value in use, which is some kind of estimate based on cash flow. For goodwill, the test is you allocate it to a cash generating unit, and then you figure out what the future economic benefit from that cash generating unit is, and does it justify the goodwill. And future economic benefit is the recoverable amount, which is cash flow. So in the end, it all comes down to does it produce cash flow. Under IFRS, you can reverse an impairment provision on goodwill generally, but or sorry, on intangible assets, but for goodwill, you cannot. So once you have impaired, have an impairment provision on goodwill, that's it. It's written down or written off, whichever you've done. So future economic benefit, we have to basically redo the math that was done on acquisition. And the client does the math and redoes it, and we check it somehow. So the client does it, we check, and we will consider measurement uncertainty and sensitivity disclosure. And if the difference between the future economic benefit and the assets starting to get small, it's probably prudent for the auditor and for management to disclose that in a note. Get my point, simpler to write it off. So, thanks for listening.